In this lesson, we're going to look at how scientists observe space. The first aim is to compare the geocentric and heliocentric model, then explain the evidence for both of these models, and then explain how technology has helped us observe the universe. Now, the universe is such an overwhelming concept, it's really hard to know where to start. But let's start at home here. This is our galaxy, the Milky Way. It is a collection of billions of stars, and each point of light here, which is so small you can barely see it, represents a star. Each star is likely to have its own planetary system, so planets orbit each one of these single points of light. And this is us. Here is our solar system. Our sun is here, and our sun is just a small star in a sea of billions. And at present, our star system is the only one which we know of to contain life. But you can see with nearly endless opportunity within just one galaxy, and there are billions of galaxies in the universe, or should I say observable universe, that's just the part we can see. You can see why people believe in aliens, believe that there must be intelligent life out there. But let's start a bit closer to home. This is our solar system as you know it. Here's our small star, the Sun. Then we have Mercury, then Venus, the hottest hellish planet you can think of. Then we have Earth with its moon, paradise if you like, in contrast to Venus. Then we have Mars. We have our failed aborted star, Jupiter. Jupiter was basically a star that never fully made it and settled as a gas giant. Then we have Saturn with its famous rings. Saturn apparently has such a low density that it could float in a bathtub, if it, of course it could fit in a bathtub. Then we have other gas giants. We have Uranus and we have Neptune. Pluto has now been disregarded as a planet. So the first four planets are rocky, then the rest are gas giants, much bigger and made of gases, not rock. But we can only really appreciate the universe and our solar system when we play around with the idea of scale. You see, this picture is very misleading in helping us understand the scale of our solar system. So let's look at it another way. Because space is so intimidatingly large, we use the idea of light years to measure it. A light year is basically a unit of distance, not time, so don't be confused by year. It's the distance light travels in one year, and that's about just under 10 trillion kilometres. The sun is 8 light minutes away from us, so in other words, the light from the sun takes 8 minutes to reach us, so when we actually look at the sun, we're looking at it as it was 8 minutes ago. If the sun blew up, we would not see it for another 8 minutes. Remember that light travels at 300,000 kilometers per second, so that is a huge distance. Every second, light has traveled 300 million meters. That's insane. But it's always fun to imagine with space, so let's imagine that we contract the size of our solar system down to a 100 meter racetrack, with 0 meters at this line here, and the 100 meter mark here. Now let's scale down all these planetary objects so that they fit according to the scale, according to their size. Well on this scale, the sun would be the size of an orange, 6 metres before the starting point, and the starting point is where we are found. In relation to the orange, we'd be just a speck of sand, one grain of sand. Now if we moved along, 25 metres or so later, we'd find a pebble. We call this pebble Jupiter. And then you'd have to travel another 75 metres before you encounter another tinier speck of sand called Pluto. You see, once you scale things correctly, you suddenly appreciate why space is called space. We are essentially specks of dust floating around in infinite space. So remember, no matter how big you think your problems are, at the end of the day, they are pretty insignificant compared to the real scale of things. So early humans used to look up into the night sky just like ourselves and wonder, where do we fit in the context of space? The logical conclusion they jumped to, the ancient Greeks we're talking about here, was that the Earth was in the centre of the universe and everything else orbited it. This was known as the geocentric model, Earth-centred model, geo for geology, geography, Earth. And this belief was held up all the way to the 1500s. So the geocentric model states that the moon, planets and sun orbit the Earth. In 1543, the astronomer Nicholas Copernicus came up with the idea of the heliocentric model. It had been thought for a while that perhaps the Earth revolved around the sun, but Nicholas was the first person to put the model together. 
We call this model the heliocentric model. Helio refers to the word sun. And this model states that all objects in space orbit the sun. Now, even this model wasn't entirely correct, but it was certainly a huge step in the right direction. So that's how we compare the geocentric and heliocentric model, earth-centered or sun-centered. So why did people believe in the geocentric model? Was it just arrogance? Did we just like the idea that we are the most important things in this universe, so everything revolves around us? Well, partly, yes. But it was also a logical conclusion based on what we could observe. On Earth, we appear to remain still, and if we look at the stars and planets in the sky, they appear to move around us. To prove it, this is a photograph that has been taken by leaving the shutter open for a long time, so the film has had a long exposure to the light. So what's happened is the stars have been emitting light, which has been picked up by the camera, but they have been moving as well, so as they move, they emit light from a new position. All this affects the film and creates a mark on the film, which we can then see as a photograph. So you can see stars literally orbit around us. So it's a fair conclusion to make. So when Copernicus came around saying, no, this is completely wrong. In fact, we are revolving around the sun. It's like telling people, uh, no, you're not actually walking. Rather, you're standing still and the earth is moving beneath your feet. It defies common sense and logic without solid evidence in place. Also, it angered the church, who liked the idea at the time that we are the centre of the universe, we are God's creation, therefore the most important thing in this universe. It wasn't until this man here, with, in my opinion, the best name in science, Galileo Galilei, and he used a telescope to observe Jupiter. He found Jupiter particularly interesting. But what particularly drew his attention were the four stars that seemed to always cling to Jupiter and move in the opposite direction to other stars in the sky. Wherever Jupiter would go, these stars would follow. He then realised that these stars weren't stars at all. In fact, they were the four moons of Jupiter. This was an incredible discovery because it proved the following. Well, if four moons orbit Jupiter then not everything orbits the Earth. In other words, the geocentric model cannot be correct. But please understand, this only disproves the geocentric model. It doesn't actually say that the heliocentric model is correct. This does not provide evidence for that, and you need to know that for your exams. So make a note here of why we initially believed in the geocentric model and how Galileo's observations disproved the geocentric model. One thing that we know now that we didn't know before is that planets actually orbit stars using an elliptical orbit. So like a squashed circle, like an egg or eye shape rather than a circular shape. And that's how we explain the evidence for both models. Now we'll look at how technological advancement has helped us observe the universe in more and more detail. The first astronomers would have undoubtedly used their eyes to make observations. Eyes are great for detecting visible light, and stars emit visible light. They also emit light that is invisible to us, but we'll look at that in more detail when we look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So stars emit light directly to Earth so we can see it, but they emit light in all directions, and some of this bounces off planets, and that's why we can see planets. So planets reflect light, whereas stars emit light. They are sources of light. So through our observations with our naked eye, we can map the positions of stars, comets, and planets. This is a comet here, a huge ball of dust and ice. But then, later on, we develop the Earth telescopes. These magnify images so they can be seen in more detail. However, they are limited by atmospheric pollution and light pollution. So they're great for observing relatively nearby objects. For example, Earth telescopes led to the discovery of Uranus. But we have done a very good job polluting our planet. I mean, if you just look at this picture here, this is the famous Hollywood sign, you can see this smog-like pollution that creates a haze, making it harder to see. And this is only from a few hundred meters away. Imagine trying to see in space through all this pollution. So the pollution obscures the light coming in from stars and planets. Also, I've noticed students don't really often understand this idea of light pollution. Imagine you're trying to see something and someone shines a light in your face. You won't be able to see anything due to this being so overwhelmingly bright, everything else seems dimmer in contrast. So imagine you were to look out at night time on a clear night sky through your window. If you were lucky, you would see a skyscape like this, when actually it should look like 
this. Yeah, if you wandered into the desert and looked up, there's very little light pollution around, very few homes, very few street lamps. So the faint light coming in from stars has no competition, so you can see them much clearer, all the faint stars you couldn't see here. I mean, personally, I wouldn't like to live in a desert, but I would love to see that. Here you're looking directly at the Milky Way, the galaxy, which is our home. Then there are space telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, and these can see farther, but they are more expensive. But look at the pictures we can get with them. This is the Horsehead Nebula. This is a star nursery where stars are born. Each speck of light here is a new star being born. They are some of the most beautiful and simultaneously violent places in the universe. And now we can fit telescopes with cameras, so we can use telescopes to take photos. This allows us to zoom in for more detail, it allows us to track the movement of stars over time. So for example, we could take one photo when a star's here, then wait a few hours and take another photo, and we can see it's shifted to another position. And also, because we can control the shutter speed, we can expose the film for longer, so we can have longer exposure of film to collect light from faint stars. A scientist once decided to fixate their telescope on one region of space where they could see no stars. Over time they kept adjusting the position of their telescope to track that one position in space. Now our eyes couldn't see anything, but what they found over time as the film collected more and more faint light from a very distant star we couldn't see, on the film the star appeared, like a ghost condensing out of nowhere. So that is how we can explain how technology has helped us observe the universe.